So this is the August uh, 2021 Mech Minute, and our topic for this month is going to be Psych Meds Gone Mad. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about some conditions that are potentially life-threatening for the patient. We're also going to talk about a couple conditions uh, for the patient, that may be, which may be uncomfortable but not le necessarily life-threatening, but which we can treat. Um, we're going to talk about these conditions because, you know, uh, we have more and more patients in an outpatient setting receiving uh, psychiatric care, and these medications that we're going to talk about are commonly used for these patients and their psychiatric conditions. The medications are generally safe, but they do have some risk for adverse uh, side effects. Uh, we're going to talk about serotonin syndrome, which has to do with the uh, common antidepressants that we see. We're going to talk about neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which could be life-threatening and it is related to use of major tranquilizers. We'll talk about tricyclic antidepressant overdoses. You know, the tricyclics have been around since since the 70s, uh, but and they're generally safe if taken appropriately, but uh, they are they are uh, potentially life-threatening if taken in an overdose circumstance. In terms of serotonin syndrome and neuroleptic malignant syndrome, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how do you tell the difference. And then toward the end, we have a couple slides to talk about acute dystonic reaction and SSRI withdrawal. These are uncomfortable conditions, but generally not uh, an immediate threat to the patient's health and well-being. And you do have some ability to manage uh, these two problems, particularly uh, acute dystonia. So why are we talking about this? Why are these things important? Well, um, these items or these conditions are infrequent, but several of them can be life-threatening, particularly NMS or neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, we also th uh, need to have an increased heightened awareness of these conditions. Uh, you see patients all the time. You see patients with psychiatric illness. Uh, they are on certain psychiatric meds. Uh, I think it's important that you have some basic understanding that, hey, these psych meds can cause emergent conditions uh, for which you will be called, and I think you should have a heightened sense of awareness on these patients. And finally, uh, you know, for some of these conditions, uh, you are able to start treatment in the field, and that treatment can either be life-saving or help the patient manage their acute conditions and become more comfortable uh, long before they, they reach the emergency department. So when we talk about these conditions, it's all about neurotransmitters. Uh, neurotransmitters are the, are the chemicals that conduct or move a nerve impulse from one to another. So if you look at this little schematic or diagram, you've got the cell body of the nerve. Coming out of that cell body is the dendrite. The dendrite then um, connects with the next nerve. That's how we propagate or move a nerve stimulus down to the next nerve. If you look at that connection between the two nerves, it, that um, is called the synapse. And here we've got the synapse. And when you talk about transmission of nerve impulses, generally what happens is a chemical is released from the nerve that is sending the signal. That's, that chemical then goes across the gap or synapse and connects to a receptor on the nerve cell, the next nerve cell body, and that causes the impulse that goes down that new nerve to wherever it's going to end. Uh, those neurotransmitters um, are then metabolized, and if we're talking about um, the medications today, um, it, these medications either reduce the metabolism rate of these neurotransmitters um, or increase the output of these neuro neurotransmitters. Um, some of the problems we talk about, uh, particularly uh, with uh, some of the drugs, uh, there's actually some interaction with the receptor. So while the transmitter goes across, it, the receptor is blocked and it can't pick up the chemical to start the impulse down the second nerve. So, you know, it's all about the neurotransmitters. Some of the key neurotransmitters, and we're only going to talk really about two of them today, but acetylcholine is one of them. Uh, it's really key in the peripheral nervous system. When we talk about um, nerve gas, when we talk about pesticides and pesticide exposure and the toxic effect of these chemicals, these chemicals affect the metabolism of acetylcholine at the synapse. So it's key in the peripheral nervous system. Um, if, we, if you look at acetylcholine, it's also important in the central nervous system in terms of cognitive function. You're able to think and problem solve, and it's this uh, neurotransmitter and its function that's damaged in Alzheimer's disease. So uh, we're not talking about Alzheimer's today, but acetylcholine is an important neurotransmitter in the brain. Uh, but for most of the time, we talk about toxic effects of chemicals and acetylcholine. We're really talking more about the peripheral nervous system. 
Glutamate is a primary neurotransmitter uh, in the CNS. Um, it's there for information. We're not going to talk about it. We are going to talk quite a bit today about dopamine. Uh, it is a uh, central nervous system neurotransmitter. It's not just a chemical we give IV because the patient's hypotensive or bradycardic. It is a neurotransmitter, and it's intimately involved with nerves that, that uh, provide motor control, that provide motivation, reward, and reinforcement. So uh, dopamine is important in terms of motor function, stiffness, and so on. Uh, dopamine deficiency is what causes Parkinson's disease. So you can think about the people with Parkinson's disease that are stiff and don't move well. It also, though, has to do with uh, our behavior and our motivation and our sense of personal reward when we accomplish something. Uh, norepinephrine uh, is, a, is part of the sympathetic nervous system, and norepinephrine is not just something we give intravenously. You know, norepinephrine as a chemical, as a drug, is called levofed, but it's part of the sympathetic system. It's part of that uh, fight and flight reflex. Um, it's, it's basically a pure alpha uh, stimulant. So norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter. I highlighted serotonin. We're going to talk a bit about that. Serotonin is involved in sleep, memory, appetite, and mood. Uh, that's why we use uh, antidepressants that increase serotonin because people are depressed in a bad mood. If you think about people with depression, they also don't sleep well and they have poor appetite. So serotonin helps all of those. And the last neurotransmitter is histamine, which has to do with metabolism, temperature control. It's involved with your sleep-wake cycle. Um, we're not going to talk about histamine either, but I want you to see that there are multiple neurotransmitters involved with our brain and uh, peripheral nervous system function. Let's talk about serotonin syndrome or serotonin toxicity. Uh, I think the, the lingo is moving more towards serotonin toxicity. Um, you know, for us, uh, the, the, the big one is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or the SSRIs. Um, the, uh, there are other medications as well, but um, SSRIs are the one, uh, key ones now. They are antidepressants, and what they do is they, they reduce the amount or the, the rate of serotonin uptake at the synapse, so there's more serotonin within the synapse, which stimulates the receptors of the receiving cell. Uh, so it increases serotonin in the brain. These medications I'm, I know you're aware of, uh, Celexa, Lexapro, uh, Prozac, which was the original, Paxil, Zoloft, and Effexor. Um, there is some risk of mortality with uh, serotonin toxicity, and Effexor has the highest mortality. Um, typically, patients who have uh, serotonin syndrome or toxicity, it's either an acute overdose of their antidepressant or they are on a SSRI and they're added, another medication is added that has an additive effect that also increases their serotonin. So, you know, they could be on an SSSRI like Paxil. Somebody starts them on uh, amitriptyline, which is a tricyclic, and now they develop toxicity. Or an old world antidepressant called an MAO inhibitor, which is very rarely used anymore. Or an over the counter uh, treatment for depression, which is St. John's wort. Uh, any of these things can induce uh, serotonin syndrome. The thing about serotonin syndrome or toxicity is it usually occurs within 24 hours. It's not something that days de develops over weeks or months. Uh, so it's relatively acute in onset. There's a triad that seems to go with it with the toxicity, which has to do with altered level of consciousness, uh, autonomic dysfunction, which could be you know fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, and neuromuscular hyperactivity. So if you examine the patient, the patient can be confused, they can be agitated. If you check their reflexes, uh, they are hyperreflexic, meaning they just don't bounce a little bit when you tap their tendon, they jump. And then they can also cause ataxia. Uh, so it could be ataxia with just sitting in the bed, or it could be if the patient stands up or tries to walk, they wobble all over the place like a, they're a, a drunken sailor. If you check their cardiovascular function, they could be tachycardic, they might be a little hypertensive, they may be tachypneic, they may have fever or hyperthermia. They can also develop multi-organ failure or renal failure, but these two problems typically are a consequence of everything else if, if the tachycardia, hyperthermia, and so on goes unchecked, uncontrolled. So the renal failure and multi-organ failure typically is a consequence of the other complications. So how do we treat this? Uh, the treatment is to resuscitate the patient. Uh, that may require intubation depending on their respiratory status. If the patient exhibits evidence of a seizure, you can use benzodiazepine. So t if the patient's overdosed on their, on their uh, Prozac, now they're having a grand mal seizure, well, we've got the treatment. We can intubate if necessary. We can give them benzodiazepines to stop the seizure. 
In the past, uh, periactin, which is an old world uh, antihistamine, uh, it's also called uh, syroproheptadine. Um, it, it's an antihistamine with antiserotonin activity. It can be given to the patient to block the toxicity, to block this increased level of serotonin. Uh, there's been some recent literature to suggest it's really not necessary or, or that it's really not that effective. The important thing is to discontinue all, all, the, the, all the serotonin or serotonogenic medications. So all the medications that are increasing the serotonin levels, that would mean stopping their SSRI, stopping their MAO inhibitor, amitriptyline, or the St. John's wort. So stop all those things. Typically, if this condition is uh, promptly identified and managed, symptoms uh, reside over 24 hours. Death uh, may occur, but it's, it's unlikely. The rate of death is, is, not, is not high. So that's the serotonin syndrome. Uh, think about it, patients who are on SSRI who are tachycardic. They're not acting right. Um, they may be a little hyperthermic. They may be a little hyperreflexic. Uh, so uh, uh, serotonin syndrome or serotonin toxicity. The other one is neuroleptic malignant syndrome. I have trouble saying that, so I'm just going to say NMS. Um, it's really an idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic or unexpected, unusual reaction to certain drugs, and it results in impaired heat dispensation, and uh, you get uh, muscle relax reaction, which is, it tends to be stiffness and, and so on. So this is a condition that usually starts uh, weeks to months after the patient is started on a neuroleptic, um, which are antipsychotic psychotic medications, uh, or it can be caused by abrupt withdrawal of dopamine agonists, which meaning dopamine-like medications. Uh, and for us, that's probably not going to be much of an issue. Most of the time, the dopamine agonists are used for patients with Parkinson's disease. But for us, it, we're most likely to see it in a patient with a chronic psychiatric condition who's on a chronic neuroleptic. And those neuroleptics include drugs like Phenergan, Compazine, Haldol, um, Dropiridol, or Respiridone. So the at-risk drugs I just mentioned, you know, the phenothiazine classes, Phenergan and Compazine, um, uh, Buterophenones or Haldol and Dropiridol and Respiridone. Uh, you may know, be very much aware of Haldol. I suspect for the patients that we see that are most at risk, they're going to be on Haldol or Respiridone. Um, Haldol is commonly used in patients as an outpatient. Uh, it's often used in the elderly when they uh, have sound sundowning in the evening. Um, so these medications are, are common. I think these days I see many more patients on Respiridone than any of the other medications, particularly on a chronic basis. Uh, and these symptoms develop over days to weeks. What are the clinical features? Uh, these patients are hyperthermic uh, and they're stiff. Uh, those are the two most uh, obvious findings uh, and really this muscle rigidity uh, and can, can result in hyperthermia and rhabdomyolysis. Uh, the patients can be tachycardic, uh, tachypnea, and hypertensive. And from the neuro perspective, uh, their level of consciousness may be altered. Uh, they may be agitated. Uh, they may have Parkinson's like stiffness and they may have some tremor. Um, Typically, these patients have hyperthermia, severe muscle rigidity. They call it lead pipe muscles. They're stiff and hard. And if uh, we get blood work on them, we'll find evidence of rhabdomyolysis because of all this muscle stiffness that results in muscle breakdown, which then results in the rhabdomyolysis and the hyperkalemia. And this is frequently associated with multi-organ failure. So the neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a true medical emergency. We have to get these patients medicated. We have to cool them down. Uh, we have to stop the medications. So what do we do for them? Uh, we're going to recognize their condition. We're going to give fluid resuscitation. We want to see adequate urine output so we can uh, be assured that if they develop rhabdo, we're perfusing the kidneys. We cool them down. So sometimes uh, it's a matter of just taking the clothes off. If they're really hyperthermic, um, we're going to put them in ice packs. We're going to cool them down as quickly as we can. These patients may require intubation, and this is one of those circumstances where if they need to be intubated, we want to avoid succinylcholine. You know, because of the NMS, they're at risk for rhabdomyolysis, and if they're uh, currently suffering from rhabdo, uh, succinylcholine will ex exacerbate that and make it worse. So these are patients we would go with to rocuronium uh, for uh, paralysis and intubation. There are two medicines out there that we can could use, uh, bromocryptine, uh, which is commonly used from some, for some of the pituitary tumors, but it can be given. 
Dantrolene is a medication given intravenously. We typically give it uh, for a malignant hyperthermia associated with anesthesia. So if we have a patient with NMS and they need dantrolene, typically we call the OR and say, we need your hyperthermia protocol. They have a cart with a, a, a big tub in it. We can, we can put the patient in ice and we can give the patient dantrolene IV. And we have to stop the drugs. We have to start, stop the neuroleptics that are causing the problem. So you're probably wondering, how do we tell the difference? Well, here's a quick chart. So serotonin syndrome, uh, typically they're on an SSRI or something similar. From a cadence perspective or timing perspective, it starts in less than 12 hours. These patients can be tachycardic, hypertensive, increased temperature, increased respiratory rate. Their pupils are gonna be dilated. They're gonna be sweaty. Uh, if you happen to listen to their bowel sounds, they'll be hyperactive. Their neuromuscular tone will be increased, so they'll be a little stiff, but they won't be rigid. If you check their reflexes, they'll be hyperreflexic and they'll have clonus. Clonus is where if you take the patient's foot and push it up, you may get a, a beat or two pushing down on your hand. Uh, that's, that's, that's normal. But if you push up on their foot and you get sustained beats, so you know it's tapping on your hand like it's a, it's a, uh, doing a bass on a drum, uh, you, you've got clonus. And the mental status on these patients is typically agitation that can progress to cl uh, coma if it gets worse. If you look at the uh, NMS or neuroleptic uh, malignant syndrome, we're talking about dopamine agonist. It typically starts days to weeks. The vital signs can be similar to, to uh, serotonin syndrome. Uh, pupils of these patients can be dilated or normal. These patients will be sweaty uh, but pale, so they're not flushed. Uh, again, if you listen to bowel sounds, they're normal, whereas SSRIs are hyperactive. Uh, I mean, for me, the key component is these patients are stiff. They're, they're not just uh, increased muscle tone. They have this lead pipe rigidity. Their muscles are stiff and tight. Uh, if you check their reflexes, they are diminished or absent. And these patients tend to be mute or in coma. Uh, they don't move much because they're so stiff and they may be staring off to space. So for me, uh, the big items I'm telling difference is what medications are they on? And what are their reflexes like? And what are their what's their uh, muscle function like? Are they are they a little stiff, a little a little tight, or are they rock hard and lead pipe rigid on their muscles? I want to talk a little bit about tricyclic antidepressants. These uh, are also medications that in, inhibit serotonin uptake, but they act a little differently than the SSRIs. These medications also, though, have potent antihistamine and anticholinergic function, and that can result in problems with the patient. These medicines are known as sodium channel blockers, which means they can affect the electrocardiogram and we can use the ECG to get an idea of how sick the patient is and to manage treatment. These medications have a very long half-life and they have to be metabolized by the liver. Very little of this medication is excreted from the body unmetabolized. If the patient takes a dose of 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram or more, that's a lethal dose. So lethal dose is 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram orally. Uh, these medications are, you know, amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and other uh, medications with similar ending names. Uh, amitriptyline is also known as Elevil. Um, they're not as commonly used as in the past, but they are still out there, uh, sometimes used uh, to help patients uh, sleep at night. Um, so you may see a patient. Um, these uh, problems, though, these medications can be rapidly fatal, which is why I think I'd want to talk about it. So what are the clinical features in overdose? You know, the big one for us, is, the big two really are cardiac and neuro. So from the cardiac perspective, these patients tend to be tachycardic. Uh, they can be hypotensive. We look at the electrocardiogram. Uh, because these are sodium channel blockers, um, we can, we'll see increases in the PR interval. The QRS will widen with time depending on the severity of the overdose, and the QT interval also prolong. If you see a QRS that's greater than 100, that indicates the patient's at risk for seizures. And if the QRS extends to over 160 uh, milliseconds, or, uh, then, um, I'm sorry, 0.16 milliseconds, uh, then, you know, uh, it, that's predictive of uh, VTAC. So, um, you know, think about that when you look at the electrocardiograms. From the CNS perspective, it, you, these patients could be heavily sedated. They can become delirious. If things get uh, bad enough, they can develop seizures and coma. But generally, the thinking is if you have a patient who's a tricyclic overdose and their GCS is less than 10, you should, you should prophylactically intubate them whether uh, they need airway support at that time or not. 
you know, think about the anticholinergic effect of these medications. Um, these patients can have dry, warm, flush skin. Um, they can have urinary retention because the bladder is paralyzed as part of that anticholinergic response. And they can have an ileus, meaning their gut slows down, and if you listen, there's no bowel sounds. So uh, the, that's, th these things are the anticholinergic effects that go along with the, the antidepressants. So how do we treat them? Cardiac monitoring is important. You have a patient who says they overdosed on Elevil, uh, amitriptyline, put them on the cardiac monitor, look at their QRS duration. Intubate early. Again, if their GCS is 10 or less, uh, have a low threshold to put an airway in. IV access. I like to have at least two points of access on these patients because they may need fluid plus other medications. If the patient's hypotensive, give them fluid bolus. For me, if they're tachycardic, I give them a fluid bolus as well. Um, so fluids are important. If they have a seizure, we know how to treat it. We got midazolam, give it to the patient. Monitor the QRS duration. If the QRS starts getting wide, we will give them bicarb. Uh, what we want to do is we want to um, uh, increase the patient's pH. We want to alkalinize their blood. How can we do that? Sodium bicarbonate and hyperventilation. So if the patient uh, starts to widen their QRS, uh, we don't wait to get to uh, 160. Uh, we will give them bicarb as soon as the QRS starts to widen, uh, and it'll help narrow it back down again. We can also hyperventilate this pa those patients. So if the patient's intubated, we're gonna give them bicarb, we're gonna hyperventilate the patient, we're gonna get their pH to 7.5, 7.55. We want them, we wanna blow off CO2. If you have them on capnography, get them under 30. Uh, that, that's, that's gonna help the patient if their QRS is widening, particularly if they are unstable. If they develop VTAC, give them more bicarb, hyperventilate the patient. Um, if you've given a, a lot of bicarb or you run out of bicarb and you're now in VTAC, you can use lidocaine at a one and a half milligrams per kilogram. Uh, it will help abort the VTAC. So let's talk about some uh, ECGs uh, associated with an overdose of amitriptyline. Here's your first ECG. It's a six lead. Uh, patient's overdosed on amitriptyline. If you look at it, uh, QRS is starting to widen out a little bit. Uh, the patient is tachycardic. Um, you don't do anything about it. Oh, QRS is getting wider, patient's getting unstable, blood pressure is dropping, um, patient is now intubated, however, uh, we're going to hit the patient with uh, 100 mil, uh, mil equivalents of sodium bicarbonate, we're going to hyperventilate the patient, and with appropriate and aggressive treatment, the ECG normalizes. The QRS duration is uh, back to normal, uh, patient's got uh, you know, pulse rate a little under 100, so they're no longer tachycardic, but they responded to treatment. So that's that's an important thing to keep in mind that if you have a patient with a TCA overdose, hyperventilation and bicarb, and you can do that in the field. All right, let's talk a little bit about dystonia or dystonic reaction. So dystonia is movement, a movement disorder with involuntary muscle contractions. For us, the most common uh, form that we will see is Parkinson's disease. It's due to a do dopamine deficiency as a neurotransmitter, so there's not enough dopamine in those synapses when a nerve impulse is conducted along the, the series of nerves. Huntington's uh, disease is a degenerative disease. It can cause dystonia as well. Um, if you ever heard of Woody Guthrie, uh, Woody Guthrie died from Huntington's disease at a relatively young age. Most people with Huntington's disease die when they're in their 40s. Um, there are now genetic markers that we can use to identify patients who have it uh, before they develop clinical symptoms. But you know, most of the movement disorders that we're going to see with involuntary muscle contractions are going to involve uh, Parkinson's disease. Well, for us, though, the purpose of this conversation, we're talking about uh, toxicity. Uh, most of the patients we're going to see uh, with acute abnormalities are going to have medication-induced dystonic reaction, which means dystonia caused by medications. And these medications are dopamine receptor blockers, and typically if the patient could develop symptoms, uh, they develop 50% uh, will do so in the first 48 hours and 90% within the first five days. So what medications um, are, are we talking about? Reglan or metoclopramide, you might see that in patients who have reflux disease. You may see it in diabetics who with gastroparesis. Phenothiazines can do it. And um, in, you know, in years past, this has been one of the most common. You know, Compazine uh, we use now um, for uh, nausea and vomiting. Thorazine is an old world tranquilizer. We use it on occasion for patients with intractable hiccups. You may see a patient on it for that reason. Uh, 
occasionally you'll come across a patient with a psychiatric illness who's on Thorazine chronically. For the typical antipsychotics, uh, we're talking about Haldol. We do have patients in the community that are on Haldol. You could have patients with an acute behavioral problem. They're starting on, start on Haldol, and now they develop acute dystonic reaction. So an acute dystonic reaction is an involuntary muscle contractions due to medications. Commonly is so, uh, uh, mistaken for uh, stroke. They can give symptoms that uh, providers may think are, st are stroke symptoms, but they're not. It's an acute dystonic reaction to medications. Symptoms of dystonic reaction typically include uncontrolled spasm of the neck and facial muscles. If you see these patients, they may be grimacing. They may be having spasm of the of the neck so that their head is uh, showing evidence of torticollis with their neck spasm and the head is deviated up and to the right or to the left. Uh, it seems uncontrollable. The patient is stiff. They may show, show uh, what we call oculogyric crisis, which is really upward fixed eye deviation to the left or to the right. Uh, there's spasm of the ocular muscles and the patient can really look weird and bizarre because their head can be uh, uh, looking uh, or turned up and then their eyes are also looking up and the patient just looks weird. They could be having evidence of tongue, tongue protrusion. Uh, they could be smacking the lips a little bit, but the tongue could be sticking out and making uh, unusual uh, movements. And the patient may actually have some evidence of laryngospasm uh, with some strider and so on. You may also notice some generalized muscle stiffness, but typically patients with acute dystonic reaction show evidence of acute spasms of the neck and facial muscles with grimacing, head deviation, eyes turned up to uh, upward, uh, the tongue sticking out, uh, and even the tongue just making abnormal movements. So how do we treat this? Well, you need to have that high level of suspicion. You know, if this patient just doesn't look right, they're grimacing, they're looking in weird ways, you know, ask the question, are you on any medications? Did you take any street drugs? Are you on any medicines like Haldol? Uh, medications that can induce these uh, reactions. And a treatment for us is something we can do in the field. It's Benadryl. We can obtain IV access. We can give the patient a dose of IV Benadryl. You give them IM Benadryl. Uh, typically, it works fairly quickly. In the emergency department, we use Benadryl. Uh, we typically, once the patient is feeling improved, we'll discharge them. We may or may not discontinue their, their medications depending on the clinical situation. Uh, often, if the patient's on chronic psych meds and needs to stay on those meds, we will add a outgoing medicine called Cogentin, which acts in a way similar to Benadryl. It's just uh, something you take less. Last often thing I want to talk about is SSRI withdrawal but, or discontinuation. Uh, you know, think about the dystonic uh, reaction. A lot of patients are on SSRIs now, and uh, this withdrawal symptom is usually due to an abrupt withdrawal of, of the SSRI. The risk is greatest with Paxil and Effexor. Uh, in part because they have the shortest half-lives, and symptoms uh, are typically within days of uh, discontinuing the medication. And for patients who abruptly discontinue their SSSRI, uh, there's a 20% chance that they're going to develop uh, withdrawal symptoms. These symptoms are generally flu-like, uh, with a headache, GI upset, a patient may be lightheaded, and they may have some vague uh, alterations of sensation of touch or vision. If the vision may be off, they may feel like uh, they've got uh, crawling something on their skin, or the, they may have some uh, weird paresthesias. But typically, uh, the symptoms are flu-like, and patients don't like this. They don't feel well. Uh, how do we uh, how do we do how do we treat this? Well. Uh, typically, we, the greatest way to treat it is try to reduce the medication slowly over two or more weeks so they don't abruptly withdraw. So if the patient's on an SSRI and for some reason it needs to be discontinued, we try to lower the dose uh, in incrementally over a couple of weeks. These symptoms are, are uh, not dangerous, but they're uncomfortable. Uh, so uh, patients may call you because they, they ran out of their medicines or they stopped their meds uh, or they're tapering off too fast and now say they got these weird symptoms and they call 911. The other thing you have to think about with these patients with the discontinuation syndrome is, is it withdrawal or is it return of the depression? Because when these patients stop or discontinue their SSRIs, um, the, the depression can return fairly quickly. So uh, sometimes the questions we have to ask, uh, you know, it, it, are the patient's symptoms due to withdrawal or are the symptoms due to return of their underlying depression, which was the reason for them to be on the meds to begin with. So that's all I have for, for this month. Um, thanks for listening. If you have any questions about, um, you know, psych meds gone mad, uh, please uh, reach out. I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you.